If you're vulnerable to psychic damage from roguish language, stay away from these gibbering mouths. But if you intend on listening to this podcast about enriching your fantastical group hallucinations, you're too far gone already. Your next game is going to be gracious and charming, and here is why. In this episode, we find some answers to how can we use charm person to get anything we want? And how do you role play a character who is under that charmed effect? And what are some tricks used by con men that can give you an edge in pulling this off? Welcome to the Hook and Chance podcast. I'm Jordan. And I'm his brother, Travis. So... Spoiler alert, charm person can't get us anything we want, but I want it, <laughs> and I need the spells that get me it. Well, <laughs> this is exactly how uh, we lose friends, <laughs> because these kind of challenges around mechanics turn into knockdown, down drag-out fights between best of friends, and this spell in particular is... Probably the cause of more falling outs than any other spell. Because simple wording within the actual spell description causes you to start conversing about like who is a who is a friend and are they a friend? And maybe they're more of an acquaintance and are you an acquaintance? Well, yeah, this is what I would do for you. It's so very vague and personal. Like <laughs> everyone treats friends differently. That's why we're not friends with dicks. Because they treat their friends like dicks. Dicks. Yeah, the challenge is is that this Pandora's box of who is a friend and what would you do for an acquaintance and how far would you go? And I wouldn't go very far at all, but you would. Uh, you have a bigger heart. Like, it's such a big gray area that, you know, a lot of people will just take it at face value and say, I guess we're not friends. <laughs> You're saying that's why it leads to those fallouts. Exactly. The end result is knowing where you stand as friends exactly it turns out <laughs> into this huge discussion this philosophical discussion about what friends are and then you start ranking the friends at the table and everyone finds out exactly where they sit <laughs> in the order of friends okay well let's step it back a little bit and suppose that your game does continue when somebody casts charm person <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't t tear friendships apart. Yeah. Okay. I mean, but still, if the game continues, a lot of the times you run into these problems with how far to go with charm person. Do they just kind of like you now? Or are they willing to go murder their parents? Jesus. I know. That's a stretch. Yeah, it is. As a new DM, I remember making some choices with Charm Person that were just like, I don't feel like figuring out where in the gray space this lies, so I'm going to say absolutely yes and keep this thing going. <laughs> yeah, you just comply. Yeah. Uh, all right. And fine. every time they cast Charm Person, they've got a new best friend, and all of a sudden the whole town is on their side. Well, and you can never claw that back as a DM, because once you've let Charm Person <laughs> get that far... Every other person that ever cast Charm Person is now going to be saying about, what about that guy? Yeah. Then they go into the lair of the Lich King and <laughs> cast Charm Person, and that's the end of the campaign. <laughs> it's good. Well, it's the end of the campaign either way. Either the DM finally puts a stop to this Charm Person shenanigans, <laughs> and the Lich King murders them outright, or, like you said, all right. You're now best friends with the Lich King. Yeah. Cool. They'll help you fight the next boss. Smash cut. Lich King's on your couch. You guys are watching the Super Bowl together. You're besties. He's, you know, making a, a nice toast at your wedding. That's pretty rad. All's well that ends well. <laughs> or maybe you even get married to the Lich King. To the Lich King. Yeah. That's very good friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we need to take a step back. And look at what we're trying to accomplish with this spell as players and as DMs and possibly other factors that could improve its use in the Strategy State Room. This is the Strategy State Room, where inventive and cunning tactics are crafted for when they're needed most.
So the question that this episode boils down to is, what do we do as a character or an NPC when we get charmed? How do we quickly determine the actions that they would or wouldn't take? And so far, what we've got it simplified to is identify the values of that character, express the charm that that character's under, and assess any requests that the charmer might be making. Well, I'm going to need you to elaborate a little bit on those steps. I will, but before I do, we need a little recap and a better understanding of what's going on here. Okay, so we're talking about two things. We're kind of talking about the spell, and we're talking about the condition that results from that spell. Right. So the spell recap is you've got a spell that's one action to cast, you got a 30-foot range, and it's got verbal and somatic components. And it lasts for an hour, which is a good solid time to like really get down and bond with somebody. Yeah, that's a half a movie. <laughs> that's a full meal. <laughs> yeah, go to, go to dinner. Don't go to a movie because you, you <laughs> can't talk and really get that yeah. good one-on-one. -on -one. That's really rude in the theater. So you attempt to charm a humanoid that you can see within range. It must make a wisdom saving throw and does so with advantage if you or your companions are fighting it. Meaning that if you're currently trying to stab somebody, they're not going to be super quick <laughs> and easy to get onto your side. Yeah. Though it could happen. If it fails the saving throw, it is charmed by you until the spell ends or until your companions do anything harmful to it. So the charmed creature regards you as a friendly acquaintance. When the spell ends, the creature knows it was charmed by you. Very good. And then we have the charmed condition, which is where a charmed creature can't attack the charmer or target the charmer with harmful abilities or magical effects. Makes sense. You don't usually attack a person that's currently charming you. <laughs> and the charmer has advantage on any ability checks to interact socially with the creature. That part's pretty simple. But the most key phrase from all of this that I want to talk about for role-playing is they regard you as a friendly acquaintance. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the ambiguous part. Absolutely. I mean... Speaking from personal experience, I have plenty of acquaintances and I don't do jack shit for them. No, you go out of your way to avoid them sometimes. I really do. <laughs> yeah. So charm person on you isn't going to do diddly squat. I just need to be a better person. <laughs> well, sure. But yes, that question, what is a friendly acquaintance? Well, the best framework for me to understand it was a list of the five stages of friendship. Because it helps me understand where that falls. So you got strangers, you got acquaintances, which is kind of just that level of I know who you are. And you got a casual friend, which takes the step to I know who you are, if that makes sense. Hmm. Like the difference between, yeah, just a, being aware of who this person is and their general vibe. I know you on a more deeper characterization level. I know yes. who you, yeah, exactly. I know you as a person. And I get along with you well. That's what you need to be a casual friend. Then you've got a close friend, which is, yeah, that person that, you know, you go on a road trip with. I don't trust a lot of people to road trip with them. Yeah, right? You wouldn't take a casual friend on a road trip. I mean, it takes a lot of trust to fall asleep in the passenger seat and not, <laughs> you know, not expect that you're going to wake up in a ditch. Yeah. And finally, you have intimate friend easy when you put a, that kind of <laughs> emphasis it really it implies certain things intimate friend is that better still friends <laughs> still i don't know i don't know if you can say the <laughs> phrase intimate friends without implying something <laughs> anyways we don't need to talk about those farther ones too much or even any of these too much but i just find it really helpful to think of the friendly acquaintance that the spell describes as being between acquaintance i know of your existence, and casual friend. I know you on a bit deeper of a level. This to me sounds like pretty much everyone that you would work with. Totally. Like the people that you enjoy talking to at work. They're like boxed in by this particular barrier. And sure, you might have become close friends with one or two of them, or you meet socially outside of work. You know, maybe you make weekend plans, that kind of thing. Those would be a little bit closer of friends. 
But everyone else within this bubble kind of sits somewhere between those two as well. Where you can get along with them, but you wouldn't accept their offer to go bowling after work. Yeah, I would not accept the offer to go bowling. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't come to a lot of birthdays. Right. It would. There would have to be something else in, in play for a birthday party, like a particular kind of event maybe happening at said birthday party or like my free favorite kind of, yeah, my favorite kind of cake, free liquor. <laughs> something else has to be in play for me to go to one of those birthday parties. And I really hope this just isn't our selfishness that we're projecting. Oh, I'm exposing <laughs> all of my horrible, deeper. Maybe you're sitting there listening to us thinking, I would do a lot of those for anyone at work. <laughs> <laughs> you guys suck ass. You're a better person than us. That's yeah. really what it comes down to. The point is, what would you do for that casual friend? Nobody that's charmed would do any more than that. That's a pretty decent framework. I think I can work from that. So let's kind of break down some of your steps. So in order to elaborate on this, I think we need three example situations that we can kind of play within where we would need charm to get us out of this. Sure. So one of the things that comes up a lot in D&D &D is, you know, you're trying to get more resources from someone giving you a quest. So we've got the Lord of the Manor who I'm... is sending you on a quest and saying, hey, can you please go and rescue this person who's currently being held hostage? I believe the uh, mayor is the only quest giver that we know how to <laughs> think it's of. It's always the mayor. <laughs> is that what you're looking for? And we need another one where the group is trying to get themselves out of some suspicious circumstances they've been spotted in the town trying to lock pick a particular door and it's not looking anything but shady right like it's the middle of the night they shouldn't necessarily be out but maybe there's a reason they are it's not like handcuff situation quite yet yeah and we've got a solo guard time to cast some charm person yeah and then we've got getting past a guard so, you know, if there's some kind of a den of vice and villainy and there's big burly guards standing outside keeping people that shouldn't be there out. You really need the like the slide, the little window slide. Is it, what's the password? Yeah. Or that from kind of Borderlands. What you want? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that first step that you want to take in these situations where you're playing that person that's just had charm person cast upon them is to... Identify a value or two that they respect. Going back to the example of coworkers, we all have a couple of coworkers that we get along with. And we have maybe a couple of shared commonalities or values that we end up talking about a lot. And that becomes kind of our thing together. Right. Like Travis, if you have somebody at work that is into video games or Dungeons and Dragons, you're going to find some common ground there. Exactly. And where I don't have common ground, I'll find something around, you know, doing certain things on a weekend. You keep having these kind of conversations until you latch on to something and you go, oh, well, this is our shared common ground. Yeah. And something to keep in mind in these being charmed situations is that if somebody does something that you don't like, then psychologically, you immediately don't like them as a person. And it's going to take a lot to get you to like them again. I mean... If one of my coworkers really loved D and D, but then I also found out that they ran a dog fighting ring, I'm not going to still talk to them about D and D. That's going to undermine. Yep, our friendship. The potential friendship there is gone, and it's not coming back. And no amount of charming is going to change that. <laughs> yeah. So the point there is that if I'm charmed, then I'm going to overlook those things that I might not like about you if I wasn't charmed. It's almost going to be a, a spot that I can't see at all. Yeah. So, you know, if that guard that's walking their beat comes around the corner and you're picking that lock, if I'm role-playing that guard and you cast charm person before we even get face-to-face, -face, then I need to think of that value real quick. So, like, maybe uh, her value is hard work. Yeah. 
And as soon as I do that, when I come up, I can go into step two, which is expressing how I'm charmed. And I can automatically think that you're out working hard at something. I'm not going to automatically assume that you're stealing because that goes really against this character's values. So I'm going to walk up and maybe just start the conversation with, oh, you're out working late, eh? Yeah, you bet. Uh, these, uh, you know, 24-hour locksmiths is <laughs> the name of the game. I'll, I, oh, I wish I had a card on me. I'll get you one next time. Oh, I respect the hustle. These uh, long hours can really wear on your family life. Oh, I yeah. It. Yeah, Timmy Timmy hates it when I'm gone <laughs> at midnight. Oh, how old is Timmy? <laughs> Timmy's 40, 13. Yeah, you must be elves, 42-year-old little Timmy. Yeah, yeah, you bet. <laughs> Anyways, like we're able to have a conversation based on it right away, rather than that situation that I usually find myself in as a charmed NPC where, yeah, again, just, okay, whatever you want, I guess. Oh, and nothing feels as defeating as a player as, uh, yeah, I guess the DM, I mean, there's no drama in this scene because the DM just has to fold, basically. Yeah. Then part three is assessing any requests that the charmer might make in that situation because I think we all know that the party's always going to ask for something outrageous when they charm person. <laughs> Yeah, like in this particular situation, now that we have charmed the guard, now we can ask and say, hey, you know what? Uh, actually, you've been really swell. I really appreciate the help from a regular beat guard. I appreciate you. Uh, we've been hassled by a couple of the uh, other guards. Can you make sure that they know that we're doing everything on the up and up here? When I consider that request... All I need to go through is a couple of quick filters in my mind to figure out if this guard's going to be likely to comply with it. So what would those filters be then? Well, does she see it as morally wrong? Does it go against any values that I've come up with so far? Uh, does going and telling other guards make her not hardworking? Not really. It almost leans into it. And then is it inconvenient? Which is, I think, is what we were talking about with our personal lives and how shitty we are. <laughs> Is this NPC busy doing something else right now? And this would be a hindrance? Or would the consequences of complying with your request possibly get them into any trouble? Because we're not going to do anything for a friendly acquaintance that's going to get us in trouble. And in this particular case, it depends on how caught red-handed or how incriminating it really looks. If it does look like we're legitimately trying to help somebody out by picking a lock, then I would imagine that guard would say, uh, yeah, no, just like try to maybe not look so suspicious and keep your cards on you next time. Yeah. I'll let some of the other guards know if I bump into them. Yeah. And of course, like having made the decision that this could possibly happen, I'm probably still as the DM going to ask for a persuasion check, which you've got advantage on because you're casting charm person. But that dice check is going to be pretty low. It's going to be like in the 10-ish range because this is a pretty reasonable request. But if you ask this guard to get you into the castle tonight or smash the window and get us in quicker and easier, yeah, that's going to be a little bit more of a request. Yeah, I'm going to set that at like 25 or something because that's ridiculous for me to do <laughs> right now. That's going to get me in a lot of trouble, and I did just meet you, and we're friendly acquaintances, so probably not. And the same thing goes for other examples like the guard scenario. Can you talk your way into a criminal gambling den? Well, that's going to be a lot tougher a sell because, again, you've got somebody in this particular situation whose only job is to keep the people out that should be out. So they're going to be scrutinizing a lot more. And that might be a much tougher check or not even a check at all. That charm person spell is likely going to fail because they have one job of be suspicious. Yeah. And I mean, maybe it won't fail to make them a friendly acquaintance. It'll do that. But still, that bouncer isn't letting their friendly acquaintances in because they're going to lose their job if they do. Well, think about trying to get into a very exclusive club. Are you going to be just 
getting any old person that you saw on the street, <laughs> not unless there's really something in it for you to take that risk. Yeah. So there has to be that give and take. And you're only giving tickets to your best of friends. Now, in those scenarios, though, there must be something else we can do to improve our odds of making it into that gambling den. There's got to be some way that Charm Person can still help us. For sure. And there's got to be ways to role play that from the Charmer's perspective, too, that's convincing and fun. And I think you and I can probably explore this a little bit more in Grandma B's schoolhouse. But first, we're going to stop by the Griffin Street Market. Must have provisions and supplies can be found for the right price at the Griffin Street Market. All right, so we got the belt of giant strength for you today. Which, I mean, how could you turn it down? You there, definitely step up. You got to try this thing on. It is comfy. It'll help you when you're going for a big moving day. You want to get it all done a lot quicker. It uh, like it's a it's like a like a weight training belt. Like it's uh, it's supposed to support your innards and keep all of the organs where they're supposed to be, right? Yeah, keep them on the inside. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Well, yeah. We just can't guarantee that your back's not going to go out immediately when you take it off. Huh. So maybe just don't take it off. Yeah, that's probably a good call. Um Alternatively, have you ever had your players go somewhere you didn't think they'd go, or is that just a me thing? No, I'd say it happens to me every session that I run. 100% of the time? Yeah. So Describe has the solution to this problem. They've got over 1,400 and growing professionally written box texts for you to use anytime at your table. Spells, places, monsters, and items, they have it all. So you can stay focused on the fun parts and don't stress about the descriptions. Type a single word and you'll get a whole bunch of box text related to what you need in that moment. The moment, at a moment's notice. I even used it the other day. I was running some Dwergar, so I looked it up and I got a couple of interesting description points to pepper in there. The cool thing is that it's fantasy game system agnostic. It contains no references to in-game rules or mechanics. It just focuses on conveying the feeling of being there. And if you want to actually hear what we mean by this, here's one for you. Rot bloats in the flesh of the corpse and what blood remains runs black. This body has no right to stand, let alone shuffle forward on dragging feet. Her head leans sickly aside of its right position atop the neck, and its tight fists she's made clearly have broken fingers. Lungs that should not work push out a gurgling wheeze from the creature's collapsed throat, sending a gout of dark fluid from between her broken lips. I think I got the vibe. Nasty. Fucking gross. That's not just someone at the market. <laughs> so you can check that and more out at describe.com. That's D-S-C-R-Y-B dot com slash hook. And use the coupon code hook for 10% off. That was nice of them to give us a nice coupon code. Yeah. Extra 10%. All right. The next stop we'll make is over on to Grandma B's Schoolhouse. Folks come here to Grandma B's schoolhouse to gain knowledge and apply the history of their realm. So when we're casting Charm Person, we're essentially becoming a con artist because we're not really this person's friend, right? Yeah. We're trying to gain their confidence and their trust extremely fast, which fortunately enough, there are people in the real world that have done this <laughs> and have not used magic. So let's get inspired by them. So do you know where the term con artist comes from, Travis? I actually don't. Well, obviously it was derived from confidence man, but that was the nickname given to a particular gent from 1849. Who was named Confidence and his last name was Man? Yep. <laughs> I'm Man. Confidence Man. That's a cool B-movie for sure. <laughs> I think you just pitched one. That was great. 
No, his name was William Thompson, a.k.a. Samuel Thompson, or James Thompson, or Samuel Thomas, or Samuel Powell, or Samuel Williams, or William Evans. When you go past your seventh name, you really know <laughs> that you've bought into the lifestyle. If somebody needs to change their name that many times in their <laughs> life, don't trust them. Yeah. <laughs> when they stumble on what your name is, that's that's a sure sign of maybe some impropriety. But I propose that he is the first documented case of the casting of Charm Person for the reasons you were just describing. And I know that on this podcast, we often tell tales of criminals casting these spells. And sure, usually you're in a situation where you're trying to trick somebody with Charm Person. It can be used for good. <laughs> but people just don't report small good acts. They report crimes. <laughs> That's the stories that we're telling. Yeah. <laughs> So what William would do is dress himself up real nice as a fine, polished citizen of New York City. And then he would approach someone from high society on the street. Because those folks were just waltzing around because there were no limousines. Yeah, I guess. It is weird to think about, you know, high society people just walking down the sidewalk because they don't anymore. But he would go up to one of these people and strike up a conversation as if they knew each other, perhaps as friendly acquaintances. His mark just couldn't quite place him. I mean, I've been in that scenario. You kind of want to, because you feel guilty as hell that you've forgotten who this person is. Right. You feel socially obliged to act like you know a person if they're acting like they know you. And after a short, confident conversation, he would ask the mark if they had confidence in him. Enough confidence to, say, lend him their watch until the next day. Okay, can we back up? Why would anyone need to borrow a watch for a day? <laughs> I've got important meetings from now until tomorrow at noon. <laughs> After which I have no meetings. <laughs> but apparently he would just like put it all on them and almost questioning their confidence. I mean, that also kicks the shit out of any kind of ego that you would have as a highfalutin kind of person of like, of course, it means nothing to me, this Rolex. Go ahead. Yeah, that's a good point, too. But I see it as like some angle of it must have just been that we know each other. So if you don't give me your watch for the day, then we're probably not friends. Yeah. And you don't necessarily want to discard me as a friend quite yet because you can't even place me. Not only have you forgotten my name, but now you don't trust me. <laughs> yeah. I was at your wedding. <laughs> And then, of course, he would walk away to forever disappear from their lives. And the way he got caught was the next day, after pulling this con on a guy, he ended up walking by him again on the street. <laughs> Whoops. And that guy grabbed him and motioned for the closest constable who happened to be, like, within eye shot. But he, he still had 30 minutes to return the watch. It was the <laughs> next day. <laughs> fair, fair. Apparently, he didn't have confidence. So the other problem that I have with this is, like, we must have all just been rubes back <laughs> in the 1800s. Like, I cannot imagine attempting to ask that of anybody today. Yeah. Like, even if I'm in a tuxedo and I walk up to somebody else in a tuxedo and go, hey, man, can I borrow your watch? No, fuck yourself. <laughs> I don't that, or have you become way worse people? Well, that's my money's on way worse people. Yeah, as evidenced by myself already in this episode. <laughs> does a con artist actually gain the trust in a single conversation? How does that even happen? Yeah, and like it is pretty impressive that these experts at this craft can do that. And this is where we get into how to role play the person doing the charming in those conversations. In addition to assessing your mark and looking them up and down and saying, what are our common values and what are maybe our commonalities of lifestyle or interests or something else like that? Yeah. You've got uh, the fact that con artists get you talking a lot. They're asking They're asking you questions about your life. They're trying to figure those things out that you just mentioned. They just seem really interested, but ultimately 
They're waiting for you to give up information that they can use. They also say your name an awful lot. Maria Konnikova, author of The Confidence Game, Why We Fall For It Every Time, so you know she's an expert, says, you can fake this. If I've looked up your picture and I can say, hey, Jeremy, do you remember me? You're not going to say, I don't know who the hell you are. You're just going to fake it. And you might even convince yourself later that you have met me. Most likely, like I've done this with somebody that said that they met me at a party and I still to this day am not particularly (laughs) sure that we met. Again, that's because you're the exception to the rule of social norms. Yeah. Also, I might have been drunk at the party, so who's to say? Yeah, they're probably right. They're probably not a con artist. (laughs) (laughs) You just have a shitty memory. They also mimic your posture. That whole mimicking thing that you've probably heard in some sleazy sales pitch to get you to increase your confidence. (laughs) Well, this is just acting and picking up mannerisms of the person that we're trying to get something from. They really just want to see themselves in us. And you've got the fact that con artists always show their flaws off to kind of humanize themselves. You always have a little bit of sympathy and empathy for somebody that reveals how they're not the greatest person. I really wish I could say no to the boss whenever they say, do a midnight lock picking job. (laughs) Don't you wish you could say no to your boss that gives you the midnight shift? Or, you know, I skipped a couple of shifts last week, so I'm on thin ice. I know I shouldn't have. I really need to get this job done. If you can help me, I'd really appreciate it. Con artists often set a ticking clock. Oh, like a limited time. I can only help you for the next 24 hours. After that, I'm on a train out of town. Yeah. That kind of, yeah, time constraints. Or even like in that situation, you know, I'm only going to be at this for a few more minutes. I'll be out of your hair. I'm sorry to have even bothered you tonight. That's a great one. Con artists start small. Basically, they want to get you to do a small favor before they ask for a big one. And often, they'll also let you win first. So, hey, they show a level of trust by letting you be the victor the first time around before they go in for the kill. Totally. Or, you know, referencing the starting small, if you're picking a lock in the dark and the guard's watching you, if you ask them to shine their light, That's a small request. (laughs) And psychologically, when we do that, when we start helping people, we want to keep helping them. Totally. And con artists dress the part when they can. Again, that uh, original con artist fancied himself up real nice. Without that, he would not have been able to pull it off. So in the scenario where we're still trying to get into the gambling den of the evil Xanathar guild... This is going to be a tall order on just charm person. But let's say we employed half of these techniques on the guard the day before. Now we're doing a little bit of reconnaissance and we're showing up and we're looking at the guard at the bar that he favors. And we're going in there dressing the part, looking like the people of his neighborhood And now we're setting a ticking clock. Hey, I really need to get in and talk to somebody within the Xanathar Guild. I've got something really good. Uh, But, I mean, if I can't get this deal today, uh, unfortunately, I'll have to go to the competition tomorrow. You're mimicking posture. You're saying how, you know, you're on thin ice because this is your last chance. Trust me, your boss is really going to enjoy this. Uh, Nah, don't worry about it. I'll catch you some other time. You're saying the guard's name. You're asking the guard about themselves plenty, getting all the details you can. Of course, this puts your DM on blast. (laughs) (laughs) Having to make up the details of a peon guard's life that they didn't expect. And what all of this means is that if you've described all of this happening to your DM and you've maybe played out a short conversation, that when the party does show up outside that reinforced a door with the little slidey window that the casting of charm person is very likely going to go a lot better than it would have the day before totally and because we all know that typically a party doesn't do all of the legwork that they should before a job you can play this out at that door 
Like if they haven't done anything and they just show up at the door and they cast Charm Person on the guard, you can still have that yesterday this conversation happened moment. If you're a DM, you ask, why should this guard trust you? What happened that this person should regard you as a friendly acquaintance? And if you are a player and you haven't yet, then you can suggest that this is one of those flashback scenes to all of the pre-work that you did prior. Yeah. We took a day, we scoped it out, we re- did some reconnaissance, and now we're putting our plan into action. That's a huge part of the uh, Blades in the Dark game is all of these flashback scenes, and it works so well for certain types of heist or sneaky jobs that you're playing out at the table. Totally. Well, hopefully, like us, you're a little better at playing these scenes out now. If you identify those values and express them and then assess those requests that are coming in from the charmer. And then, of course, if you play out that ability to charm a little bit more in your sessions, keep working on it, then these are going to start to have a lot more life to them. Absolutely. And charm person and being charmed is so much easier to role play with a couple of these constraints in there. If you have a lens to look at what that's like to be charmed, think of that moment where somebody came up and thought that they met you at another party sometime. And that all of a sudden puts you into this defensive weird zone where you go, maybe I should trust this person. And what would I do for this casual acquaintance? Murder the boss. (laughs) <laughs> obviously that's that's what you'll do for your casual acquaintance we have a new review and this one uh, kicks the shit out of a lot of other reviews whoa 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 you don't well, set the standard too high they set the standard at the highest it's literally the title is the best D podcast I mean, the only next (laughs) review could say the best podcast. Like, there's no other definitions that could be more ultimate. (laughs) Well, feel free to do that. Leave a review that says the best podcast if you (laughs) want. But also, don't be afraid to just leave a review that says, I liked it. I I mean, honestly, we're both okay with that. We're both tremendously humbled every time we get... Another of you in the door, it means so much to us that you would take the time to write one. But this one says, five stars, among a vast sea of D&D podcasts, Hook and Chance really is a cut above the rest. It's the only RPG podcast that I look on Monday morning to see it if it's downloaded. For starters, the audio quality is head and shoulders above <laughs> Basically, all the others that I have tried. This can be a sticking point for me. I don't understand putting out a mediocre quality when audio recording has become so cheap and easy over the years. I appreciate that you appreciate fine audio quality. This show is actually listenable. They have a good mix of super useful ideas and suggestions mixed in with the right amount of tongue-in-cheek humor. It's a delicate balance and difficult to pull off, but these guys seem able to do it. Seem being the op- <laughs> operative there. My tongues are always slapping around my cheeks. It takes like 30 takes. <laughs> Finally, I have definitely improved my DMing thanks to their advice and ideas. Seriously, they seem to put a lot of effort into making this show useful. There's that seam again. Well, they can't say for certain what's happening behind the scenes here. <laughs> Thanks for the show and keep up the amazing work. Apparently they can see what's going on. This came from Remote Viewer 93 from Apple Podcasts. Spooky. Yeah. Thank you, Remote Viewer, for as much as we poke fun. Yes, this review filled our sails again so we can sail the seas of high podcasting. God, we're ending on a high note, huh? (laughs) This is... What? You don't like my pirate adventure at the end? (laughs) Oh, boy. We've jumped the shark. Thanks to Tabletop Audio for the sound effects that you heard in this episode. You can follow us at Hook and Chance on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or Reddit. You can also join an awesome community of players and DMs by joining our Discord. Thanks Thanks for for listening, listening, and Travis will not come to your birthday. Even if it's bowling. You gotta have some dank (laughs) food.